weights, which are essentially just ordinary probabilities. Uh, so the density operator comes in two forms, in which you have either a discrete a set of probabilities, a set of states with corresponding probabilities or a continuous range. In any case, the average value of an operator A measured across an ensemble is given by the trace of the density operator times the observable in question. And uh, moreover, we distinguish a, a pure state as a special case of the density operator in which there's only one, uh, only a single, uh, in effect, only a single term in the discrete sum here, which enters with 100% probability. In that case, rho is a projection operator onto the one dimensional subspace scanned by the single pure state. If the state is not pure, that is to say, if it can't be written in this form and you have to write it as a, as a sum of terms, then it's considered to be a mixed state. Uh, so we're conceiving a, of a pure state as a special case of a density operator, in effect taking the density operator as primary, and then pure states as something that's a special case of that, be derived from that. This, in fact, is the most satisfactory uh, point of view. Uh, however, the, the, the logical structure of what I've presented so far is, is not very satisfactory. It's, in fact, circular, because here I've defined a density operator in terms of pure states, and then I end up defining a pure state in terms of density operators. So I'll fix that up in a minute, but in the meantime, I just want to say that this conception of the density operator as a statistical weights of pure states is nevertheless useful. It's a useful way of thinking about the density operator, as in, for example, the Gnomkin experiment, where we had a, um, a uh, beam which was polarized in a random direction. All right. So in any case, what I'd like to do is not to be too particular about the logical structure of this, but just to take this, these expressions from the density operator and derive certain properties of them. So allow me to do that. Unfortunately, I have to cover this up in order to use the board here. But I'm going to derive now uh, some uh, important properties of the density operator, which there's three that I want to mention. We call them A, B, and C. Uh, the first property of the density operator is that it's, uh, it's Hermitian. Uh, to expose the formula again. It's obvious that it's Hermitian because the probabilities are, are real numbers, and these outer products are Hermitian operators, the sum of Hermitian operators. The uh, second property is, is that the trace of the density operator is equal to 1. Uh, this is easy to prove in that form of the discrete sum, because if I take the trace of rho, that's, uh, for simplicity, I'll deal with the case in which we've got a discrete set of probabilities and discrete set of states. So the sum over the uh, discrete probabilities, and then the trace of the outer product, which is the projection operator here, the trace of that is the inner product. That's how you take the trace of the outer product. And so it turns into the inner product of psi i to psi i. But we're assuming that the psi is normalized here, so this just turns into the sums of the, of the probabilities, which is equal to 1, because probabilities have the 1. So the property of the density operator that its trace is equal to 1 uh, should be interpreted as being a normalization condition on the probabilities. Then the third property of the density operator, which I want to mention, is, is that rho is uh, non-negative definite, which I'll write for short by just saying that rho is greater than equal to 0. This is in quotes. That's what it means, the same thing. I'll remind you that an operator is non-negative definite, the definition of non-negative definite, if its expectation value with respect to an arbitrary state is non-negative. So let's take an arbitrary state phi and let's sandwich it around the row like this and ask what do we get. Well, again, using the discrete sums of the probabilities, this is the sum on i of probabilities fi, then we have phi scalar product of psi i times psi i scalar product of phi. And these last two factors here are complex conjugates of each other, so this is the absolute value of y scalar prime of psi by quantity squared. And you can see the entire sum. If the probabilities are non-negative, these are non-negative, so the whole thing is non-negative. And we get, uh, we get the conclusion that it's a non-negative definite operator. This non-negative definite uh, property is also connected with the interpretation of rho as, a, as describing the probabilities of the system. The reason is, is that uh, you may be aware of this, but this scalar product squared is interpreted in quantum mechanics as being the probability of finding a system that you measure, measure the state phi. Given that it was in state psi i initially, this thing squared is the probability of finding it in state phi. Never mind that. We, we will, uh, this is, this types of, these types of interpretations come out of the, uh, the, uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics rather easily. But my point is, is that this has an interpretation as a probability 
And we have to either probability, so the probability is the psi eyes. So altogether, what we're getting here is, is something that has to be a probability, and that's why it has to be a non-negative number. In any case, these are the three principal properties of the density operator. All right. Now, um, to uh, go back to this point I was making earlier, that the density operator is primary, and uh, uh, pure states are are, in, are to be considered a special case of that. Uh, important, an important part of this interpretation is the fact that the density operator is measurable. So, in a sense, we don't have to define it, we just have to say how one measures it. The idea is, is that if you make the, if you compute the expectation values of enough operators or enough observables A, which are given by the trace of rho times A, one can determine rho from the results of the measurements. Now, I will prove this in the general case, but what I will do is, is illustrate this for you for the case of the spin one half system, which is actually an important case in practice. So, um, to go to the new board, uh, the uh, immediate project here is to show how you can measure the density operator in a spin one half system. In a spin one half system, the spin operator can be written as h bar over 2 times sigma. It is, of course, proportional to the magnetic moment operator. And if we were doing a stern gerlach experiment, we really, from a physical standpoint, the stern gerlach experiment measures magnetic moment. Since they're proportional, I'll we'll always talk about spin. All right, so the idea is the following. Is that, is that if we measure the uh, average value of the spin operator, that means we take our ensemble systems and we take the average value of Sx, Sy, and Sc and get three real numbers, constituting a real vector here. One can measure that. The problem is, so given this, the problem is then how uh, how do we find the density operator from that? Spin one half system has a Hilbert space which is two dimensional, so the, the operators are represented by two by two matrices. And so the question is how do we determine what the density operator is, what its matrix is? Well, to answer this question, I need to make a regression into some properties of two by two matrices and poly matrices. Let's let uh, M be uh, a 2 by 2 matrix, any 2 by 2 matrix. <coughs> then it's a fact that M can be represented as a, which you may well know this fact, it's a fact that M can be represented as a linear combination of the identity matrix and the three poly matrices. And let's call the coefficient of the identity matrix A, and let's call the coefficient of the poly matrices B, which is a three vector since there's three poly matrices. All the there are four coefficients which makes sense because a two by two matrix has four numbers in it. In effect, the identity and the three poly matrices form a basis of two by two matrices in terms of which an arbitrary matrix can be expanded. To show that, you just need to show that these four matrices are linearly independent. I, I won't go through that, but it's, but it's a straightforward to do that. But the question then is, how do we determine these expansion coefficients A and B? To answer that question, I want to make a little regression into some further properties of the poly matrices that I probably should have done in last week's homework, but I didn't. Anyway, here's what they are. These are trace properties of the poly matrices. Well, first, let's talk about the trace of the identity. Trace of the identity is equal to 2, as is obvious because trace is a sum of the diagonal elements, and the identity matrix has got ones in the diagonal. Uh, the trace of the poly individual poly matrices, all three of them, is equal to zero, as you can see just by looking at them. And then the third formula I want to quote is the trace of a product of two poly matrices, sigma i times sigma j, is equal to twice product of delta i j. Uh, this third property actually follows from the last week's homework problem, where you show that sigma i sigma j is equal to product of delta i j plus i times epsilon i j k sigma k. Uh, the notation used here is delta ij is understood to be multiplied by the identity, so I'll put it in explicitly now. And uh, if we take the traces of both sides, then on the left-hand side we get what we want here, and on the right-hand side the trace of the identity is 2, so we get twice delta ij, and the trace of, this, of the sigma term, this term is 0, because of this middle identity here, so that goes out into the trace. And so what you get is the result quoted here is that uh, you get twice the delta by j. Uh, so I'm going to erase the, the proof of this and, and just leave uh, the, uh, the, uh, the trace identities for polymorphisms. <coughs> by using those identities, we can solve for these coefficients a and b. Solve for the coefficient a, well, first, first of all, just take the trace of both sides of this equation. 
trace of M is equal to A times the trace of the identity, which is just twice A, plus the trace of that term, which is zero, because B is just a, a vector of numbers, and, and, and the trace of the signals is zero. So it's 2A plus zero. And the result of this is that we find that A, the coefficient A, is one half the trace of M. Likewise, if I take M and multiply by, let's say, sigma I, I get sigma I times one of the, one of the poly matrices. Sigma I times M is equal to A times sigma I plus sigma I times B dot sigma. I'll write this as BJ sigma J using the summation notation on, on, on the J's. The B's are just a number, so I can move them to the left. To the left. And what I have in terms of matrices is just the problem of sigma I sigma J. Now if we take the trace of both sides of this, we get trace sigma I M is equal to zero in the first term. And in the second term, we get B sub J times twice delta I J using the trace expression up there, which is the same thing as twice B sub I, doing a little bit of three-dimensional tensor analysis. And this is equivalent to saying that the vector B is equal to one half the trace of the poly matrices sigma, the vector matrices sigma multiplied times M. So uh, these, these two boxes here are the, are the main results for the expansion of the two by two matrix as a linear combination of identity and poly matrices. Here's how you get the coefficients. All right, now to return to our problem, which is given the, uh, given the expectation value of spin, how do we find the, the, uh, the density operator? Uh, let's uh, say, first of all, the density operator in the standard plus and minus SMC basis is a two by two matrix. So it can be written as A times identity plus B times, times sigma. And the question is just what are the coefficients? Well, from our, so I'm just interpreting calling, row, calling it rho now instead of m. So what you see right away is that a is equal to one half the trace of rho. Well, the trace of rho is equal to one. That's a normalization condition of the probability. So a is equal to a half. And as far as b vector is concerned, that's equal to one half the trace of rho times the, uh, uh, excuse me, it's trace of one half rho times sigma using, again, it's replacing m by rho is all I'm doing. Uh, however, uh, allow me to take this expression and to multiply and divide by h bar over 2 because h bar over 2 times sigma is the spin. But if I do this, this becomes 1 half times 2 divided by h bar times the trace of rho s. But the trace of rho s is the average value of the spin, is, is, which is something you can determine experimentally. And so this turns into 1 half times 2 over h bar times the expectation value of the spin vector. And the result of this is that if I take these A and B coefficients and plug them in here, then what we get is that rho is one half of the identity plus two over h bar times the expectation value of spin dotted into sigma. And that's the answer to our problem. Namely, uh, given the average value of spin, how do you determine the density operator? This is it. It's an example of how, on the general principle, that the density operator is measurable if you make the measurements of a sufficient number of, of, uh, of observables. This is a simple case because uh, there's only, uh, just a second, because there's only a, a, a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, in, in higher dimensions, you have to obviously make measurements of a larger number of operators. But this illustrates the general principle. Yes, it's a question. How do you know rho and sigma can be? Because I don't. Uh, rho is a, a two by two matrix, and the sigma is a, is a three, not three other two by two matrices, and in general they don't commute. So here we have B equals trace of sigma M, and there we have rho. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You were concerned about the order of the. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, one of the properties of the trace is that you can cyclically permute the factors, and the answer doesn't change. So it, it doesn't, I was probably sloppy about the order I wrote it, but in fact, it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So uh, this is an example of this. Now, uh, before leaving this example, let's ask a further question. Uh, let's ask what are the conditions such that this density operator represents a pure state? Uh, perhaps you'll recall that in the case of the thermal beam, we found that the density operator was just one half the identity. That was because the expectation value of the spin was zero, remember? So you see this formula agrees with our earlier result on that. Uh, but uh, well, let's ask the question, what, uh, what's the condition that this should represent a pure state? Well, I'll remind you, a pure state is when the density operator can be written in terms of a 
it's a normalized cat style like this. It's a projection operator onto a one-dimensional uh, space, which is spanned by the cat in question. Uh, and since it's a projection operator, it means that its eigenvalues are either 0 or 1, are the eigenvalues of rho. Uh, now, this is not uh, generally true. It's only true when rho is a projection operator. So this is for a pure state. For a pure state, the eigenvalues of rho are either 0 or 1. And moreover, the eigenvalue 1 must be non-degenerate. That's to say the eigenspace must be one-dimensional because then the psi, the state vector for the system, is a vector that spans that one-dimensional subspace. So um, this, is a, this is a criterion for a pureness of a density operator. It has to have only these two eigenvalues, and the one eigenvalue must be non-degenerate. Well, um, what about this? What about this density operator? Under what conditions does this represent a pure state? Well, leave it as an exercise for you that if you take this, if you take the, if you take this expression for an arbitrary uh, two by two matrix, and let's let A and B be real, uh, because if they're real, this implies that the flow is Hermitian, and the other row is Hermitian. So these are real vectors now. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that the eigenvalues lambda are equal to um, a plus or minus the absolute value of vector b. It's just a straightforward exercise in a two by two matrix. But in our particular example, where, where rho has this form and the a and b coefficients are given by these expressions here and here, we can plug this in and ask what are the conditions that one of the eigenvalues should be one and the other one zero. Well, this is going to require that a let's say plus the absolute value of vector b is equal to 1, and a minus the absolute value of vector b is equal to 0, these two conditions imply that a is equal to the magnitude of b, which is equal to 1 half. Well, we already knew that a was equal to 1 half because that was necessary to the trace condition of rho. But now we find that in order to get the two eigenvalues of 0 and 1, the magnitude of b must be also equal to 1 half. So the b vector here is, is, is this, this thing here. It's 2 over h bar times the expectation value of s. So what we conclude is, is that rho is pure, a pure state, if and only if the expectation value of s is equal to h bar over 2 times the unit vector. Let's call it n hat, some unit vector. In fact, one can show that generally the, expect, the absolute, the magnitude of, of, of S is less than or equal to h bar over 2. This is the maximum value of the magnitude of the expectation value of spin that can take R. In that case, then we can write rho in this form as equal to 1 half of identity plus the unit vector in question dotted into the Calvin matrices. And for a spin 1 half system, this is the general form of the projective of the density operator for a pure state. Now, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out what psi is equal to. This is, of course, going to be the eigenvector of this matrix with eigenvalue plus 1. And it's, so it's straightforward to figure it out. But this then gives you the wave function. This is how you get a wave function starting from a density operator. Notice that if you don't have a, a pure state, then there is no wave function. Okay. Now, uh, so that's the. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about the measurement of the density of It's an important basic practice, as a matter of fact. Now, um, what I'd like to turn to now is, uh, is uh, quantum statistical mechanics. Uh, statistical mechanics is applied whenever you have incomplete knowledge about the state of the system. Uh, in classical mechanics, it means you only have some probability distribution uh, probabilistic sense is the, you only know the state of the system, the classical state in a probabilistic sense. It's usually described by a probability distribution in a classical phase space, which is called the Leibniz distribution. In quantum mechanics, the uh, repository of all the information, the probabilistic information you have about the system is actually the density operator. So the density operator is a central object in quantum statistical mechanics. Now, density oper different density operators are appropriate in different circumstances, depending on what knowledge you happen to have. Uh, and just as in classical mechanics, uh, there are uh, different, different uh, ensembles one might consider. Uh, and um, so uh, one can think of uh, different, different density operators corresponding to different ensembles in different, uh, different physical situations where one has more or less knowledge about a system. 
Now, as you know, the one's knowledge about a system is quantified by the entropy. Uh, to give you a little history of the entropy, the uh, entropy was uh, originally conceived in the 1860s and 1850s and 1860s by Kelvin and Clausius. It was originally conceived of as a, a quantity that applied to a system of thermal equilibrium, like a problem of water at a given temperature. And uh, it's still considered this. This is one of the ways entropy is used. Uh, however, uh, somewhat later, uh, Boltzmann uh, realized that the entropy, the concept of entropy could be generalized also to non-equilibrium situations, and that the entropy became, in effect, a function of the probability distribution of the system. And Boltzmann wrote down this famous formula for what that, what that probability is, or what that definition of entropy is. So to make a long story short, if I take Boltzmann's formula, which was classical from the 1870s or 80s, I'm not sure the exact date, and make an obvious transcription into quantum mechanics, then what you get is an expression for the entropy. It now becomes a functional of the density operator. And this is the formula. So the entropy is minus k, which is Boltzmann constant, uh, times the trace of rho times the logarithm of rho, the rho's density operator. <laughs> and this can also be written as minus k times the expectation value of the logarithm of rho, because remember the trace of rho times an operator is the average value of it. It's the average value of log rho is seen across an ensemble. Uh, I'm not going to justify this. Uh, that, that's another course to do it. But this is the definition of the entropy in quantum mechanics. Now, uh, the, uh, I will remark, however, that what we see here is a, is a logarithm of an operator. Remember, rho is an operator. It's an emission operator. It's observable. Uh, and uh, back when we were doing the uh, notes number one on the mathematical mathematics of quantum mechanics, I think I mentioned this when we were in a lecture about the, the function of what, what it means to talk about the function of an observable. The idea is that you go to the uh, eigenspaces of, of a given observable and to compute a function of the observable. The function of the observable has the same eigenspaces and therefore the same projectors, but the eigenvalues get replaced by the function of the eigenvalues. That's, that's how you make a function of an operator. If the function is a polynomial or, or something that can be expanded in a Taylor series, you can also conceive of the function of an operator by means of the polynomial or the series of the operator. In that case, the two definitions are the same. The logarithm doesn't have any Taylor series expansion, not about rho equals zero anyway. Anyway, the concept of a function of an operator is defined for all observables, even for rather strange functions. In this case, it's just the logarithm, which is not the strangest that we'll ever see. All right. Now, um, so as I say, this is a functional of the, of the, dens of the density operators. So different den density operators give you different entropies. One remark is, is that if you have a pure state, the entropy is zero. And if you have a mixed state, the entropy is always positive. So a state of minimum entropy is where you're in actually a pure state. Um, now, uh, the game we frequently play here is we, uh, we uh, impose constraints on the, on the system. We say, for example, we know uh, quantity I'll call E, which is defined as the average value of the energy, the Hamiltonian, which more exactly is the trace of rho times H. Well, let's suppose this is given. So in other words, let's suppose we have an ensemble in which the average energy is known. There's also, of course, a normalization of rho, which is equal to 1. This is also a given. It's another constraint of rho. And if we maximize, this is really Boltzmann's game that we're playing here. If we maximize the entropy subject to the constraints uh, that, uh, that the average value of energy and the normalization are given, then it's possible to determine what S is. And S turns out, excuse me, not what S is, what rho is. But it turns out that rho in this case becomes proportional to e to the minus beta h, where h is the Hamiltonian. The beta here is a Lagrange multiplier and the constrained uh, maximization process, but it's otherwise 1 over kt, the usual beta parameter in, in statistical mechanics. So uh, this is easy to do, but I'm not going to do it because it's the wrong course. But I do want to point out that the, you get this density operator under these conditions, which stands for the canonical ensemble. That is to say, it's an ensemble that physically means a system is in contact with the heat path, or you create your ensemble of systems by taking and putting them in contact with the heat path removing them and doing an experiment on them, such as measuring their energy or some other observable. All right. The normalization constant that appears here, this is just proportionality, but the normalization constant is 
is a traditionally called one over capital C, so we write rho is equal to that thing with one over capital C. And the normalization is determined by commanding the trace of rho is equal to one. And if you do this, then this implies that z, which is a function of the thermodynamic parameter beta, is the trace of e to the minus beta h. So the Hamiltonian, let me put a box around that because that's the basic result in quantum statistical mechanics. Z beta, of course, is a partition function. Um, stands for a German Zustand Zuma, some of some of the states. Um, the trace is, of course, the sum of the diagonal elements of, a, of an operator. Here we've got uh, an exponential operator, the Hamiltonian. Uh, a convenient basis in which to do the, the sum of diagonal elements is the energy eigenbasis. So let's introduce an energy eigenbasis. Let's write it this way as nr is the basis. Let's say the energy eigenvalues are en. And this is the same cat all over again. Let's say these are normalized here. So the n labels the energy eigenvalue, and the r is an extra index used to resolve the generacies, in case there are some. So let's say r goes from 1 up to, let's call it g sub n, which is the number of the generate energy eigenstates. Then uh, this trace, we'll move this box, this trace can be written this way. It's a sum on n and r of diagonal elements, let's say nr, sandwiched around e to the minus beta h and r, like this. However, since these are energy eigenstates and we're acting on them by a function of the, of the Hamiltonian, it just brings out a function of the eigenvalue. So this gets replaced by e to the minus beta e sub n, the energy eigenvalue of the state. And the result is this turns into a sum on n and r, e to the minus beta e n, times the scalar product of nr with itself, which is 1 since the states are normalized. So we can write this as a sum on nr of e to the minus beta e n. Or since the sum n does not depend on r, the degeneracy index, we can write this as just a sum on n times the order of degeneracy times e to the minus beta e n. And I end up after this with the formula that you probably learned in undergraduate stat net courses for the partition function that's, that's given by this in terms of the genesis and energy eigen, eigenvalues. It's really a normalization of density out there. Now, there was a little secret that they never tell you in undergrad stat net courses. Uh, you spend a lot of time calculating the partition function because it's useful for finding things like the equation of state, and a lot of important things can be derived from it. But it actually does not give you complete information about the statistics of the system. If you want that, you need to really need a density operator and not just, this, not just the trace of this thing, you need the whole thing. So for example, if you're talking about a gas, maybe it's not an ideal gas, and you want to know correlations between particles, that's something you can't get from the partition function you need the full density operator. All right. Um, now, um, I think that was the main thing I wanted to say about that, except I'd like to now give you an example. This is an example of the density operator so you can see how it works in practice. Um, the, uh, roughly speaking, the basic idea is that the different energy eigenstates in thermal equilibrium have probabilities that are proportional to the, just the Boltzmann factor. So that's an easy rule, e to the minus beta times energy. It's an easy rule. So these are not normalized probabilities, but it's the only way to relevant probability it's easy to do. Let me give you a physical example of that. I want to talk about hydrogen gas, uh, but I mean atomic hydrogen and not the hydrogen molecule. Ordinary hydrogen gas in laboratory is H2, and I don't want to talk about that. Um, gas and atomic hydrogen occurs in astrophysics, so these galaxies, galaxies are full of large clouds. Uh, many of the clouds contain atomic hydrogen uh, predominantly, not, not, not molecular hydrogen. It's a simpler system, actually. Atomic hydrogen, of course, has an electron and a proton, and they both have spin, they both spin one half particles, so either spin can be up or down as a total of four, four spin states. And because of magnetic interactions between the electron and the proton, uh, these states, states are actually split into two energy eigen states called the singlet and triplet state. And uh, so let me tell you about them a little bit. There's a singlet and triplet state. Schematically, the singlet looks like this where the spins are opposite and the triplet states where they're parallel. And if I write these states as SM, where S is a total spin and M is a total magnetic quantum number, and the singlet state is 0, 0, and the triplet state is 1, M, 
and m is equal to 0 and plus or minus 1. That's why it's called a triplet state, because there's three states. Let's call the singlet state also 0 and the triplet state 1, or let me call it E0 and E1, because they actually have different energies. In fact, the E0 is really the ground state of the hydrogen atom, and E1 is slightly above it. They're split in energy by this magnetic interaction that I mentioned. The energy difference between these two states, this is called hyperfine splitting. The energy difference between these two states that is translated into a wavelength unit for the photons that are emitted on the transition is at 21 centimeters. So this is the famous 21 centimeter line that's important in astrophysics. If you translate that into uh, temperature units, it's about 5 kelvins. The actual temperature of these gas clouds out there is comparable to 5 kelvin, or in fact, maybe, maybe somewhat larger than that. But in any case, the point is, is that the temperatures are, are such a magnitude that the Boltzmann factor is important in determining the relative populations of these two energy levels in these, uh, in these uh, clouds of atomic hydrogen. And in particular, the relative probabilities of the two levels are e to the minus beta e zero and e to the minus beta e one, except it's a little bit tricky because e one has got a threefold degeneracy, so I need to multiply by three. Those are the relative probabilities. And to put it another way, the partition function z of beta is just equal to the sum of these two, these two terms like this, the sum of the Boltzmann factors times the degeneracies. What is the density operator? Well, it's 1 over z, that's the normalization. In the singlet state, it's e to the minus beta e0. And then there's a projection operator on the singlet state like this. And then for the triplet state, it's e to the minus beta e1. And then what you've got is a sum over these magnetic quantum numbers of 1m, outer product of 1m. This sum is the projection operator onto the degenerate triplet state. And this outer product here is the projection operator onto the non-degenerate ground state. And here is a density operator describing uh, those, uh, those uh, atoms out in the galaxy. Now, um, there's a question which, so the probabilities can be just read off as the coefficients of these terms, the various terms here. Uh, you see that the three excited states all have the same probability, they have the same energy, and therefore the same probability. Now, um, what we've got here is uh, two states uh, with, uh, with uh, certain probabilities. If I, uh, if I took a linear combination of the ground state and some of these first excited states, then from the coefficients of the linear combination, I would also have certain probabilities. The question that arises is, what's the difference between this density operator and some linear, if there is one, and, and, and some linear combination of the ground state and the excited state? The answer is there is a difference. This is what you call an incoherent mixture. Uh, it's the same thing as saying that it's a mixed state. Whereas a particular linear combination of ground state and excited state would be what you call a coherent mixture, which would be a pure state. Let me try to describe this from a more, in a more general language without, without reference to this hyperfine uh, transitions in hydrogen. Let's say that we have a density operator for some system now. Let me just make it any old system. And for simplicity, let's suppose the energy eigenstates are non degenerate, so I'll write this thing in like this with weights Fn. This is really the same notation I was using earlier for you know, a general density operator. The Fn's are the weights and they're also uh, probabilities, so they sum up to one. This is the density operator. Now let's also consider a pure state psi, which is given by an ex its expansion in terms of energy eigenstates with some complex coefficients that look like this. This is what you're used to doing with expanding states. Now if you have this linear combination of states, then you know the probability of finding a system in an energy eigenstate n is the square of the coefficient c n squared. So these things are, are positive number, non negative numbers that add up to 1, so they're just like these probabilities f here. The question is what's the difference? Is there some, is there some physical difference between these two? Uh, supposing the c n squares were equal to the f, so is there any difference between these two? <coughs> The answer is, is that if you're only going to measure energy, you couldn't tell the difference between the two because you get the same probabilities for the energies. But if you want to measure other observables, then there is a difference. There's a physical difference between them. This is a, this is a, this is a mixed state. This is a, this is a pure state. 
To understand this, uh, allow me to do the following. First of all, let me take this complex number CN, and let's take its absolute value and call it just AN like this. And then let's like, write CN as if it were AN, which is its, uh, its, its uh, magnitude times the phase factor to the I phi. And no, let's just write C in terms of amplitude in phase four. Then, let's take this pure state psi, and let's uh, compute the density operator that corresponds to it. That's, of course, just the other part of the psi of itself. We're taking this series, forming its complex conjugate, forming the bra here, and multiplying them together. You get a double sum that looks like this. It's a sum on, sum on n and m, with a sub n times a sub m times e to the i phi n minus phi m times the outer product of n with m. It's represented as a matrix in the energy representation. And as you see, it's not diagonal. This matrix is diagonal. This one has off diagonal elements. And so that's one of the differences between this density operator and this one, which is a pure state. Now, in many circumstances, the phases which appear here are not known as well as the amplitudes. The amplitudes are related to the probabilities. The phases in many circumstances are not as well known. One of the reasons is, is that the phases are time dependent. In fact, by the Schrodinger equation, phi n is equal to minus E n times T, where E n is the energy eigenvalue. So these things evolve in time, the phases keep increasing in time. If you're taking an off-diagonal term where n is not equal to m, then the energies are not equal, and so the difference between these phases grows in time. And ultimately, it'll get to be an arbitrarily large multiple of 2 pi. If there were some errors in the energy eigenvalues where you didn't know them precisely, then those errors would, would ultimately result in phases that were about uh, phase differences, even that were completely unknown to within a multiple, uh, to within a factor of two pi. In other words, they become effectively random, at random phases after a sufficiently long time. So what this suggests is that you go from this pure state into a statistical mixture in which the statistics is given by a random phase ensemble. And these phases are all independent, statistically independent of one another, and uniformly distributed between zero and two pi. If we do that, then we'd like to replace this pure density operator by a statistical average over phases. Well, the average over phases only affects this term because nothing else depends on phases. So let's take u to the i phi m minus phi m, and let's average it over the phases. And what do we get? Well, if n is equal to m, these two phases are equal, and so they cancel out the the average value of 1, and the answer is 1. But if these energy levels are not, not the same, then you've got independent random variables that are uniformly distributed around a circle, and the average is 0. So this average turns into a product of delta n m. And so if we take the statistical average of this pure state, what do we get on the right-hand side? This thing is going to average to product of delta n m. It collapses into a single sum. It becomes the sum of n of a n squared times the outer product of n with n. In other words, it looks just like the Boltzmann. It looks just like the Boltzmann or a, well, this is, this is the Boltzmann ensemble if the f n's are the Boltzmann factors. More generally, this is a, an ensemble that's diagonal in energy representation. And that's what we get in this random phase, in this random phase ensemble. So in particular, the ensembles that are the canonical ensemble the in thermal equilibrium can be thought of as a, an ensemble in which the, uh, the uh, probabilities of being in different energy eigenstates is known, but the phases are completely unknown. So it's equivalent to the point of view. Right. Now, um, so that's uh, enough about the canonical ensemble. Uh, in fact, that's all I want to say about the density operator. What I'd like to do now is to go back to the postulates of quantum mechanics. This is all in the notes, so we don't have to copy this down. Uh, go back to the postulates of quantum mechanics, which I presented earlier in a uh, incomplete form, because we were using it was incomplete because we were using uh, pure states, which at that point was undefined and uh, revise those postulates now in terms of uh, density operators. So some of the postulates are the same as before. One is still the same. The physical system corresponds to a net space. Two is different. The state now of the system corresponds to a density operator rho, which is a Hermitian operator with unit trace and whose uh, is non-negative definite. That's what that expression means. Three is still the same as before. Every measurement process corresponds to an, an observable and a complete emission operator in the maximum and ket space. 
And, uh, the result of uh, item number four is the same also. Is the, eigen, uh, the results of the measurement are the eigenvalues of the observ observable, either the, the discrete or the continuous, depending on what you have. Five is a probability postulate. It now becomes modified. The probability of finding the result A equals A n in the discrete case is the trace of rho times P n, where P n is a projector onto the corresponding eigenspace of the operator A, the eigenvalue A sub n. In the continuous case, the probability of finding A in some, in some interval, let's say from A0 to A1, is a trace of rho times the projection operator that corresponds to that interval, which is the integral of the outer products along the inter interval in the continuous variable A. Here I've included the sum over the degeneracy index in case there's degeneracies. And here's the interval is I. So this is a revision of the first five postulates. And as far as the sixth postulate goes, then I'll remind you that, in, that the, uh, in, in the case of the pure states that we talked about a couple of lectures ago, the collapse postulate said that after the measurement, uh, the system's been projected onto the eigenspace uh, of the observable whose eigenvalue you've got in the measurement, uh, so-called collapse uh, postulate. Uh, that is replaced by something else when you have density operators and I'm leaving that as an exercise for you to fill in item number six here. It's a good exercise for thinking about what density operators be. All right, so that's all for density operators. And uh, now I'd like to turn to the radio subject. Are there any questions about density operators before I go on? Yes? Is there a, uh, a more general criterion for um, looking, like, is there like a Here. Yeah, uh, there are several criteria, and I've mentioned some of them in the notes. So here in lecture, I only mentioned the, the more obvious one where you diagonalize and you get the eigenvalues. That sort of always works. Uh, there's easier ones, though. Uh, it turns out that uh, rho squared equals rho if and only if it's pure. Uh, you can see that if rho is psi psi, and you square it, what you get is rho squared is, you see, and this is just one. So rho squared equals rho in a pure state. And the converse works too. It's pure if and only if this condition holds. Um, the uh, another condition is the trace of rho squared. Actually, the trace of rho squared is always less than or equal to one. But if the trace of rho squared is equal to one, then it's pure. And yet another one is the entropy. The entropy is equal to zero if and only if it's pure. This is maybe not so easy to use for patients who feel the entropy you need to get a log of rho, and so you need to get its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And if you're going to do that, you might as well look at, might as well use a simpler criterion. But still, it's interesting because the zero entropy means that you have the maximum information you can, you can have about the system. It's not a pure state. That doesn't mean that you've eliminated statistical uncertainties in the measurement process, because quantum mechanics is intrinsically statistical. So there will still be statistical distributions and answers for then different systems. But this is the maximum we can get. Are there any other questions? All right. So what I'd like to do now is to turn to the uh, turn to the, uh, uh, the the question of spatial degrees of freedom. We've also talked about spin. Uh, so let's talk about spatial degrees of freedom now. Uh, to make this simple, uh, let's first of all take a 1D case so that we're thinking of particle moving on the line here coordinate x. And um, let's also suppose that there's no spin or any other variables around except for the position variable. Uh, that's not quite what I mean. There are other variables around like momentum and so on. But what I do mean is, is that a complete set of commuting observables, which is what you need to measure in order to get things down to one dimensional subspaces of the space, consists of just the x operator itself. That's all there is. Uh, I'm going to use the notation putting a hat on the x to indicate an operator. I'm sorry because sometimes I use a hat to indicate a unit vector, but it's hard to get a good notation for this. So in the present case, this means operator. And this is to be a contrast with x without the hat, which stands for a number. There's something I should have told you a couple of lectures ago, so I'll tell you now. It's a little bit of a digression. There's an old terminology due to graph, uh, which is that he talks about what he calls q numbers and c numbers. And uh, you hear it, it's useful terminology, so I'll tell you what it means. A Q number basically means an operator. And a C number means an ordinary number. 
So we usually use this terminology when we want to draw the distinction between, let's say, an operator and its eigenvalue. So in any case, the x hat here is the q number, and the x, which is the variable, the coordinate is the c number. Now, so we'll just take it as, as, as given that x hat by itself in this one dimensional problem is a complete set of commuting observables. The, uh, when we measure x, measure position, of course, we get a continuous set of values. So if I take the eigenket eigenvalue problem for the operator x hat, it looks like this. I label the eigenket by its eigenvalue, and multiplying operating with x hat just brings out the eigenvalue. This must be a member of the continuous spectrum because we know measuring position takes on continuous values, at least until we get down to the Planck scale where nobody knows what happens. <coughs> and as a result, the normalization of these position eigenkets must be understood in a delta function sense, like this. And moreover, the resolution of identity is, a, is an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity the other product of x with x. This all just follows from, from uh, basic, uh, basic uh, formulas in the quantum mechanics. Now, um, let's uh, inquire as to the probability of measuring x to lie in some interval. And let's say this is with respect to a pure state. Uh, having done the density operators now, you're going to find that in most of the rest of the course, we'll be talking about pure states. Um, this is, I, as, I, as I have said, in, uh, in, in, I think in lecture and certainly in the notes, this is a, uh, a bias of quantum forces, but in real experiments, you're always using density operators and not, not wave functions. You can't really always much. Anyway, uh, let's say we have a pure state psi, and we're interested in the probability of measuring x to lie in a certain interval. Well, by the postulates of quantum mechanics, this is psi sandwiched around a projection operator that corresponds to that interval, where that projection operator, pi, I is an interval here, is an interval x0 to x1. It's an interval from x0 to x1 of bx from the other product of x with x. It looks just like the resolution of the identity, except the interval doesn't go all the way to infinity, just over the interval. In any case, this means that this, this probability is then equal to the interval of bx from x0 to x1 of psi scalar product of x times x scalar product of psi. Now at this point, we make a definition. We define the quantity x scalar product of psi to be equal to the wave function psi of x. And in this manner, we sort of derive wave functions from the Ket formalism, which was promised earlier. Um, and with that uh, definition of the wave function, you can see that this integral, the first factor is the wave function complex conjugate, the second factor is the wave function. So this is an integral x0 to x, x1, of dx, the absolute value of the wave function squared. And so the result of this is that the probability of lying in this interval is the interval of the interval of psi of x squared. Therefore, psi of x squared is the probability of density, which of course you know that this is how it, how it comes out. Now, um, this definition here, uh, let's see. Yes, this definition here can be thought of in another manner as well. This is, in effect, a part of a translation table that takes you from cat language to wave function language. If you're given the cat psi, you want to find the wave function psi of x, you just take the scattered product from the left and the position I can find. How do you go the other way? Suppose I'm given the wave function and I want to find the, the cat psi. Well, the answer to that is, is I take the projection operator here and multiply both sides by the cat side. So I get the cat side itself on the left hand side. On the right hand side, I get the scalar product of x with psi, but by our definition, that's the wave function. And so the result is we get this formula, this cat psi is equal to the integral, this is all from minus infinity to plus infinity, of dx of cat x times psi of x. And this goes the other way. If you get psi of x, you can now find the cat. But it does something else too. It shows you that the wave function is nothing but the expansion coefficients of the quantum state, the vector in the Hilbert space, with respect to the position basis. 
this is one of the reasons why we think, we should think, of Psi of X is, in some sense, not having a terribly privileged role, because you can take a vector Psi and expand on lots of different bases. It's a, it's a large, large, great choice of bases. And uh, this is just one of them. It's just a position basis. <coughs> All right. Now, um, there's another point to be made here about this, which is that uh, the wave function psi of x is single value. It's single value because it's nothing but the expansion coefficient of the state vector psi with respect to the position lightning pass. So for a given value of x, naturally it has only one value. This is an issue which arises sometimes in solving the Schrodinger equation, which is, of course, what you do in introductory courses. When you separate the variables and so on, there's some point we have to say, well, we have to, we have to require the wave function to be single value, and what's the physical justification for that? Well, this is really it. This is the reason the wave function is single value. Right. Now, I've done this all in one dimension, uh, but it's easy to generalize this to three dimensions. If we do it in three dimensions, then there are really three position coordinates, x, y, and z. And so each one of them corresponds to an operator. It's a measurement of the three coordinates like this. And now the complete set of commuting observables, still ignoring spin, assuming there's no spin, uh, complete set of commuting observables is the three variables x, y, and z. Uh, or I'll also write this as x hat i over i equals 1, 2, and 3 with an index on them. Now, one thing to say right away about these three observables is that they commute with one another. X hat i commutator of x hat j is equal to 0. How do I know that? Uh, I remind you uh, that, that uh, the commutativity of operators is something that can be subjected to experimental tests. It has to do with the fact that if operators commute, then you can measure them in either order, and you get the same statistics on the doubly filtered system. So in this case, if we measure x, for example, by putting a slit in the, x, in the y direction so that you're so you slit in uh, yeah, you want this. See, yeah, if you want to measure x, but slit the y direction, just like this. And if you want to measure y, you can slit the x direction. And so what it leaves behind is a little square. And uh, let's just say, one can say that experimentally, it can be determined that the statistics of the ensemble you get doesn't matter whether you put the x slit first or the y slit first. It's the same answer. So this is equivalent to the commutativity of these operators. By the way, they have to commute if they're going to form a complete set of commuting observables, because that's what that C stands for, is commuting. All right. Well, in this case, we have eigenkets. We have simultaneous eigenkets of the three observables. We can call that x vector like this. And these are actually simultaneous eigenvalues of the, of the three operators. x hat i equal to x vector is equal to x i, the eigenvalue times x vector. This is actually three simultaneous eigenvalue eigenvalue equations. Uh, most of the uh, most of the formalism uh, for uh, that I just described in the one-dimensional case goes over with uh, kind of only obvious modifications going over to the three-dimensional case, and um, uh, so I won't bother to write all that out. But you have resolution of the identity now becomes the threefold integral for all space. Here, instead of talking about the probability of the interval, one talks about the probability of finding the particle in the region in space. The absolute value of psi squared is the probability of density in three dimensional space and so on. It's a straightforward generalization of three dimensions. Okay, uh, so I'll stop now. Uh, just tell you uh, next time, which is coming up tomorrow morning, uh, I'll be uh, telling you about translation operations.